In March, much before 25th, my father got a letter. At that time, my younger sister, who was 14 years old, the letter said that she has been heard using derogatory terms against Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, and she must be handed over to the Mukti Bahaini so that appropriate action may be taken. My parents, they were aghast. They knew what would happen to my sister. So in the dead of the night, they took her to the Dhaka airport and she was put on a flight to Karachi. I could sense that things were getting from bad to worse and Indian machinations were being followed according to a copybook, according to a textbook. And this was one of the you know, most uh, heinous acts that they could do because they wanted to isolate Pakistan. We were living in an apartment of the Dhaka University campus. Our next door neighbor used to every day show a big dagger, which he used to sharpen and say, he would say that this is the dagger I'm going to slaughter you with. In these five decades, 50 years, the Indians have spread so much of propaganda so much of venom and so much of uh, falsehood that people have ex started accepting it as the truth. As in the beginning, I just told you that even the Bengalis have started believing in it. Words, the ring in my ears, that it is time that the lions come out with their own narrative. And until they do that, the hunters will continue to be the heroes. In 1971, I was, in fact, in, since 1970, I was a cadet at the PF Academy Rizalpur. And in January 1971 was the last time that I visited East Pakistan. The next time I went there, it was Bangladesh. And while I was in Dhaka, the Ganga incident took place, that is the hijacking of an Indian Fokker by the Indian raw agents and they landed that Fokker in Lahore. They set it on fire after letting the passengers go and using that as a plea, they shut the overflight rights for Pakistan. And I was stranded in Dhaka because I could not go back to my, uh, to the academy on time because now the flights had to be rerouted through Sri Lanka. And uh, of course, I was late in reporting, but I could see, I could sense that things were getting from bad to worse and Indian machinations were being followed according to a copybook, according to a textbook. And this was one of the, you know, most uh, heinous acts that they could do because they wanted to isolate Pakistan. My father indeed was a professor at the Dhaka University and our residence was at the Dhaka University campus, which was surrounded by a number of student halls. At that time, we could feel that the students' halls were being now accommodative of the Indian agents who were posing as Mukti Bahainis as students and arms and armament were being amassed. In March, much before 25th, my father got a letter at that time, my younger sister, who was 14 years old, the letter said that she has been heard using derogatory terms against Sheikh Mujibur Rahman and she must be handed over to the Mukti Bahaini so that appropriate action may be taken. My parents, they were aghast. They knew what would happen to my sister. So in the dead of the night, they took her to the Dhaka airport and she was put on a flight to Karachi where my mother's sister and her husband, they received her and they stayed with them. Before the 25th, a number of students or rather Mukti Bahaini posing as students, they would come and mock my parents and they would say that we can kill you anytime. But since you are in our midst, we'll take care of you. And we were living in an apartment of the Dhaka University campus. Our next door neighbor used to every day show a big dagger, which he used to sharpen and say, he would say that this is the dagger I'm going to slaughter you with. And yet they continued there. But on the night of the 25th, when the military action
took place. The army came in and they had a list of people. The, the ISI knew exactly who were the leaders and they only pinpointed those and picked them up. A number of my parents' friends, in fact, it was just a two bedroom apartment because at that time my father was only a lecturer. 32 families took refuge in our house and my father, Bengalis, and my father gave them refuge because after all they were their friends and they stayed with us. But on the night of 25th, there was military action, there was gunfire and some of these leaders, they were killed. On the morning of 26th, an uncle of mine who used to live in Mohammedpur, he came on his jeep and he asked my parents that you must, you can no longer live here, come to my house. So they left everything there and their friends who, of course, also found refuge elsewhere. And my father sent away my mother and other siblings to Karachi, but he himself stayed on because he wanted to continue his duty. In fact, he was there till the last flight of PIA took off. Twenty fifth March action was taken because I'm sorry to say, and my parents are a witness to it, and my own research points to it, and so many other researchers point to it. The killing of the Biharis and the massacre of the Pakistani army personnel had begun way before 25th of March. In fact, on 7th of March, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, of course, there are so many reasons why he was forced to do it, but had announced that Bangladesh is a reality and the people must now stand up for their rights. And if on 25th of March, the army action was taken, it was actually in a retaliation to and to stop the massacre of the Biharis and the Pakistan army personnel and the non-Bengalis and West Pakistanis who were there in East Pakistan. First of all, one of the uh, myths that has been created is that the Pakistan army on the 25th of March, it carried out a massacre of the Bengali intellectuals. And I know a number of intellectuals were killed because my father is a witness to it. But the question is, who killed them? Was it the Pakistan army that out of spite it would kill the Bengali intellectuals? No. I have researched this question and I have come across a very interesting, I mean, I would say a fact. And this came about through the statement or rather a television interview of Yuri Bemisnov, who was a KGB agent and who was posted to India at that time. In fact, he was in Calcutta and he has presented uh, facts and figures stating that the Bengali intellectuals were actually harbored as KGB agents. And if you are aware of the two-step flow of communication theory of mass communication, you should know that one of the ways of carrying out subversion and bringing down a state to its knees is that you corrupt the minds of the intellectuals and the opinion builders and plant either through subliminal programming or through propaganda or through brainwashing the loss of confidence in the state, in the leadership and in the armed forces. And then these opinion builders, they further, since they have this sway a whole opinion, they carry out the brainwashing of the masses who, if you have followed the novel of uh, George Orwell, Animal Farm, the masses are like sheep and the sheep are given various slogans and the Bengalis were given slogans by the same intellectuals. But Yuri Bernstorff confesses that once the deed was done, that is Bangladesh was created, it was severed from Pakistan. Since these intellectuals, they knew too much and they were going to be a liability so they were eliminated 
by the KGB and by agents of the KGB and by raw so that the truth doesn't come out who were the minds behind it and who were the operatives who had swayed the minds of the Bengalis and that is why they were eliminated. I call myself uh, the supporter of the truth, but I find it sad that we Pakistanis, or I should say even uh, we West Pakistanis, but what is left of Pakistan, lack the art of telling the truth as a narrative. Whereas the Indians, in you know, following the Chanakian dictum of tell a lie so often that it becomes the truth. Please remember that whenever a war is lost, the vanquishers, they have their own opinion. They narrate tales of swelled bravery and they look down upon the vanquished and they call themselves cowards and losers and whatnot. Yes, we lost East Pakistan, but we had a story to tell. Unfortunately, we did not tell it on time. As I mentioned, a few of my seniors and superiors, people like Siddiq Salik, people like uh, Kamal Matinuddin, and then international opinion builders like uh, uh, Miss Bose, whose book uh, Dead Reckoning, who happens to be also a, of Bengali origin. She is the great uh, grand niece of uh, Subhash Chandra Bose. They have come out with the truth or a counter narrative, but it is not enough. Junaid Ahmed in the recent years has come out with it, but again, it's not enough. In these five decades, 50 years, the Indians have spread so much of propaganda, so much of venom and so much of uh, falsehood that people have ex started accepting it as the truth. As in the beginning, I just told you that even the Bengalis started believing in it because the Bengalis do not want it to be known that it was the Indians who were the ones who got them the freedom. They like to take pride in the fact that they won their freedom themselves. But why did they rise against Pakistan? Especially a nation where Muslim League was born. Muslim League was born in the streets of Dhaka. It was Fazlul Haq who presented the Lahore Resolution on 23rd March 1940. It was Nawab Sar Salimullah. It was Suharwardi, the first four prime ministers of Pakistan after uh, Liaquat Ali Khan happened to be Bengalis. These were people who were at the forefront of the Pakistan movement. So now they have to justify that why Bangladesh was needed. That is why, yes, West Pakistan has been looking down upon East Pakistanis. There was a sense of superiority, the, even in the armed forces and so on. But it wasn't to the extent as it was blown out of proportion by the seditionists and their narrative has prevailed. If these false accusations are narrated in the textbooks of Bengali children, they are going to believe their own textbooks. And on the other side, we never came out in a massive way to counter these propagandas. Today, we are making an effort, but I'm sorry to say, even my book, Tormented Truth, is but a feeble attempt. We need to do much more. We need to go out on the electronic media, make movies. Yes, I just saw a movie, Khel Khel Me, which is a very bold attempt. I must appreciate it. But much more has to be done. It was the Bengalis who raised the slogan of Pakistan. It was the Bengalis who fought for it because they knew that we had to wrest our independence from the British. But you see why the Bengalis no longer celebrate 14th of August because it will be a negation of the Reza, the Eth of Bangladesh. Because Bangladesh was created after denying Pakistan, 
after denouncing Pakistan, after stating that Pakistan is no longer capable of looking after the interests of the Bengalis. But that was the propaganda then. Now, if they do that, it will be accepting what they stood for in the earlier stages, what their forefathers did. But they can no longer celebrate 14th of August. Actually, uh, if you read uh, uh, Maulana Abul Kalam Azad way before the formation or way, way before the independence, but when independence was coming about in an interview to Shorish Kashmiri, who then went on to publish the words of uh, Maulana Azad in a book called The Man Who Saw the Future of Pakistan, had predicted that East Pakistan is not going to last more than 25 years. But you should remember a few facts. First of all, that the Radcliffe mission, a Sir Cyril Radcliffe was the head of the uh, Boundary Commission for determining the boundaries of the states of Pakistan and India after partition. He was swayed by Lord Mountbatten and Lord, Lord Mountbatten, who was the last vo British vo Viceroy of United India was a very close friend of Nehru. In fact, there are stories that in Bollywood is even making a movie about it. Mountbatten's wife Edwina was having an affair with Sir with Pandit uh, Jawaharlal Nehru. And through Edwina and through Mountbatten, Sir Cyril Radcliffe was swayed to create the boundaries in such a fashion that Pakistan will cease to exist in a few years. And that is why Kashmir and the so many other in instances were created as flashpoints which would trouble Pakistan. Qaid Azam Muhammad Ali Jinnah was given the understanding that there is going to be a corridor through India joining Pakistan, uh, East and West Pakistan. But that ne never took place. In the final years of his life, Qaid Azam Muhammad Ali Jinnah was fatally ill. He had a terminal disease. And he hid it from his detractors. He hid it even from his friends. The only person, two persons who knew about it were Fatma Jinnah, his sister, and his personal physician. So he was too frail at that time to fight this. Yes, it is true that 1,000 miles or 1,400 kilometers of hostile territory dividing East and West Pakistan was bound to create problems. But you see, our leaders in the initial stages, especially the ones who came after Liaqat Ali Khan and after the Qaid, they did not have the foresight of the vision. Our enemy did. I mean, <laughs> K.M. Panikar, who happens to be an Indian naval strategist in his 1951 book, India and the Indian Ocean and the Influence of Sea Power, writes and he predicts that Pakistan is going to have two navies, one for the protection of West Pakistan and one for the protection of East Pakistan. It is sad that we did not pay heed even to the words of our enemy and we did not create two navies. In fact, what is more tragic that we were ruled from 1958 to nearly 1969 by Ayub Khan who did not like the concept of having a, a proper navy for Pakistan. What to talk about two navies? At one stage, he was considering disbanding Pakistan Navy, but some of the senior naval officers like A.R. Khan and others, they prevailed upon him and asked him to continue. But if we had had two navies, India would never have been able to blockade East Pakistan and our line of logistics would have remained open. And even after the Ganga incident, we would have continued to defend East Pakistan and the secession of East Pakistan could have been avoided. But the fault lies in our stars that we were bestowed upon by leaders who lacked the vision and the will to protect East Pakistan. Frankly speaking, uh, 
it is so simple to say that India was responsible for it. It was Indian machination. It was Indian planning. It was Indian treachery. But the fact is that the enemy will always be the enemy. The enemy will always plat, uh, plot and plan to dismember you, which it had actually the Brahmins of India were aghast at the thought of their motherland, which they consider sacred like a mother, to be divided into two parts. And they had sown at that time when the partition was announced that they are going to get back the entire territory and merge it into Mother India. And people like Savarkar and so on, they had talked about Greater India and Akhand Bharat and so on. But if you talk about a single personality, first of all, we should have been aware of the Indian machination. We should have been aware of what is happening. Sheikh Mujibur Rahman was used by the Indians, but I am told that even he was aghast. He did not actually want to go the whole hog. He wanted to get more, uh, what you call, uh, facilities for. He wanted uh, East Pakistan to be at parity with West Pakistan, as far as finances are concerned, as far as resources are concerned. And some of these were given, but then it was rather late and it was being exploited. I mean, it, it was Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, who when he came to Islamabad, he said that from the roads of Islamabad, I can smell the jute, which is being the major issuer of finances for the exchequer. And that is being used to build a beautiful capital like Islamabad. It was indeed uh, taken cognizance of. And a second capital at Dhaka was created, which I had seen even before the fall of East Pakistan, and which if you go now is still there. It Many resources were there, but at the same time, there were people who were creating this propaganda. There wasn't one single person. Yahya Khan was at the helm of affairs. He should be held responsible for taking a decision because even way before the March 25th action, there were three eminent personalities who were there on the ground, who had their ears to the ground, who could foresee what's coming up and they could also foresee the machinations of the enemy. And they were Vice Admiral S.M. Hassan, who happened to be the governor of East Pakistan. It was Lieutenant General Sahib Zada Yaqub Khan, who was the senior most military officer, the general officer commanding, and the air officer commanding, Air Commodore Mitty Masood. And all these three, they were no spring chickens. They were war heroes. Sahib Zada Yaqub Khan had fought the Second World War. He was a decorated officer. He had been taken prisoner of war. And he was a strategist beyond imagination, a person who wrote the entire syllabus of the Pakistan Army uh, Command and Staff College, Quetta, and who is revered all around the world. Admiral Hassan happened to be the ADC of Lord Mountbatten. He happened to be the first ADC of Qaid Azam Muhammad Ali Jinnah. He had also fought the Second World War and he knew what was going on. And Mitty Masood was an air commander, but as a group captain, he commanded uh, the base of Sargodha in 1965 and led Pakistan to an aerial victory. When the three of them, they tried and convinced Yahya Khan with detailed presentations and a plan was presented, which is now in history known as the Asan plan, how East Pakistan could have been saved, how the 25th March action could have been avoided. And Yahya Khan was nearly convinced but unfortunately, there were politicians in West Pakistan and also some short-sighted generals, but mostly ambitious politicians who wanted to get the seat of power because in the 1970 elections, Mujibur Rahman had been given the maximum seats and as such, he should have been invited to form the government. He kept waiting for such an invitation, but it never came because the West Pakistani politicians, they were afraid. Of course, they had their reasons and there was a likelihood that the Indians would have, would not have been able to convince Sheikh Mujibur Rahman to break up East Pakistan. And instead, he would have proved to be a more competent 
prime minister of the whole of pakistan but that occasion never arose and these politicians they made sure that the national assembly session is never called where sheikh mujibur rahman is elected as the prime minister of a united pakistan so i will say that there wasn't one personality but all these things and then circumstances and then myopic considerations and short sightedness of our leadership at that time that caused it but i'll not pin it pin the blame on one person alone if you insist on it then the person who was at the helm of affairs generally ayah hindsight is uh, 2020 but uh, even then uh, sheikh mujibur rahman himself was of the opinion that it is a, a bargaining chip it is a debating point and uh, you see if you go through the six points very carefully you find that i mean prima facie some of them may appear to be very drastic but they could have been uh, negotiated and he would have simmered down to some of them or compromised on some of them the misfortune is that these uh, were not discussed in detail especially by yaya khan he never took a briefing about it and uh, for uh, zulfikar ali bhutto it was uh, one of the major aspects by, by which he could flog the horse of east pakistan's uh, separatist or sheikh mujib's separatist ideas but i personally feel that if we had bargained if we had talked about it uh, things would have been different we were so full of enthusiasm and we used to listen to the speeches of our leaders and if we also heard the speech of general niazi that uh, the indian tanks would have to march over his chest to get it to dhaka that somehow we were convinced that dhaka is not going to fall and when it did it devastated us i remember i was on night guard duty at that time when the news was finally announced by the government of pakistan and i felt so dejected and so did all of my friends me mostly so because i was so much in love with this pakistan i thought that was my home we used to carry these g3 guns which were of course fully loaded because we had to guard the aeroplanes pf academy rasalpur was also being used as a air base at that time so out of sheer anger we fired in the air letting out our anger because we thought we had been betrayed as far as uh, you see learning lessons is concerned i don't think we have learned lessons we see communities in pakistan which are marginalized or which feel marginalized and which are being used again by the enemy in a similar fashion that the bengalis were misled or they were agitated to rise against pakistan take the example of the baloch and even to some extent the sindhis and the pashtuns they are being agitated that their rights are not being met true that east pakistan was a great distance away but even over here we haven't gone to the extent of appeasing those people because please remember where there is smoke there is fire there are reasons for which these people are being agitated for which being these people are being turned into insurgents or they are being turned against the state and i had in the beginning of my interview i had mentioned the various steps by which opinion builders do it but at this moment also we see certain opinion builders who come out in the streets and they agitate the people with false propaganda at times or stretching the truth to an extent which will suit them i don't want to name names but it is happening all around us so that means we haven't learned the lessons 
and let's talk about the baluchis for example let let's talk about the pashtuns for example let's talk about uh, some of the marginalized sindhis for example these are people and even let's say southern punjab if we do not take the whole nation along if we do not listen to their rights then the enemy will continue to exploit them so that is the reason that is the lesson we should have learned from east pakistan okay east pakistan is gone it is now bangladesh which is a reality but can we allow the balkanization of pakistan please remember that in the west even maps have been issued of a fragmented pakistan of a new south asia hopefully it will not happen but we need to take steps that the enemy does not achieve its heinous goals actually it is very unfortunate and it is very unfair why unfair because the people who were there in east pakistan and bihari by the way it is a generic term the people from the province of bihar because it was contiguous to bengal had come and settled down in east pakistan and here i must relate a small anecdote which is ironic that in 1946 before the partition had actually taken place bihar riots took place and the chief minister at that time of bengal of united bengal was hussain shaheed swarwar and one of his student leaders was sheikh mujibur rahman and both of them they toured the whole of bihar they tried to stop the riots and at that time suharwardi and specifically sheikh mujibur rahman asked the biharis that when pakistan is formed and becomes independent you are welcome to settle in east pakistan and then a day came when the same biharis i'm now continuing to use the term bihari but please remember it's a generic term when they came to east pakistan they were actually initially welcome because this is a hard fact that there were very few in fact there was only one major uh, you see government bureaucrat who was a bengali but the biharis they were in greater numbers and they came and they set up the railways they set up the industries and they set up the various offices they were a little uh, more experienced in these matters and they assimilated they tried to assimilate in the culture of east bengal but they stood out because of their separate language because of this slightly separate culture although the religion was the same at after some time a certain amount of animosity and jealousy was also there which was of course spurred on by india and later on when raw was formed in 1968 they carried out a propaganda campaign telling the bengalis that all your rights have been usurped by the bengalis and by west pakistan so when the bengalis they decided to uh, start an insurrection at that time the biharis who had upheld the flag of pakistan they wanted that east pakistan should never be severed from the uh, state of pakistan and they should continue to do that what they could do at that stage was join the pakistan army not in uniform but through their own local militias like al shams al badr and fight along with the pakistan army because please remember 25th of march onwards what you call the military action actually we had lost east pakistan east pakistan had virtually separated so 25th of march onwards the pakistan army along with its supporters of ashams al badr and so many all these biharis and their militias they took back inch by inch the whole of east pakistan this insurrection was not only in dhaka or uh, around it it was a proper break away of course in which the indian soldiers in the garb of the mukti bayani were there fighting carrying out massacres and killing people 
and that is where the Biharis stood out because the West Pakistani army did not know the terrain so well. They did not know the area. They did not even know the language and the Biharis were their eyes and ears. And when the crunch came, that is the 16th of December when East Pakistan was no more. The same Biharis were now who were upholding the flag of Pakistan. They were labeled as collaborators and as traitors by the Bangladeshis. And some of them, unfortunately, were even massacred after the 16th of December. And beyond that, they were stripped of their nationality of Bangladesh. They applied, they asked permission to be sent to West Pakistan, which now became just Pakistan. Only 170,000 was approved, of which even the full number did not come. The rest were put in camps. They continued to stay there in ghettos as second-rate citizens, worse than the Rohingya Burmese. And they are still there for the last 50 years because they refuse to call themselves Bangladesh. They stand for Pakistan. But it is unfortunate that in this part of Pakistan, we have welcomed the Afghanistan, Afghans. I'm not saying that was a bad thing. Yes, we have a tradition of hospitality. We call ourselves the Ansars of Medina. We should have supported the Afghans when they came here. But the Biharis, they should not have been forgotten. They should not have been left there. And they continue to live in squalor because now they don't have the means of the houses, the businesses and other things they had. Instead, they are forced into labor. The Bangladeshi government had announced that those children who were born after 1971 will be given the citizenship of Bangladesh and will be also given the right to vote. But this is so far only on paper. And I know that more than 250,000 Biharis, they continue to live in despondency, in squalor, and as if they are beggars. But they are proud Pakistanis because for them, in their minds, they are still living in Pakistan, however hard it may be. And we need to do something about it. Now, as far as Pakistan and Bangladesh are concerned, it is very important that as Pakistanis, we should learn to accept the blame where it lay. But for Bangladesh, it should also realize that the myths that have been created about 3 million Bengalis being butchered, about 200,000 or 2 million, whatever figure they say, of the women being raped. And I have gone to the extent of bursting these myths because they are based upon fallout. Yes, there were cases of rape. There were cases of butchery. There were cases of loot and plunder, but not to the extent that is being exaggerated. And it happened on both sides. It was the Bengalis or the Mukti Bahinis or the Indian raw agents acting in the garb of the Bengali Mukti Bhaini who carried these heinous acts. A simple DNA test can prove the mass graves that are being shown as evidence of Bengalis being massacred. It will prove whether they are the bodies of non-Bengalis or Bengalis. As far as the women who are being propagated that they were raped, it was the government of Bangladesh which announced an award of, I think, 200,000 rupees for each woman who would come forward and say that she had been raped. Do you know the number of women who actually came up? It was less than 2,000. So that means this is an exaggeration. So as far as the future is concerned, 50 years have passed. Let us now let bygones be bygones. Let us be ready to forgive and forget. The Bangladeshi government insists that we as a nation and our Pakistan army must ask and beg forgiveness from the Bengalis. We are ready to do that. But only if the Bengalis also accept 
their part in this heinous game in which precious lives were lost because i myself lost an aunt and two cousins my aunt was brutally raped and killed so were my cousins i'm ready to forgive and forget that was that was my personal loss but as far as pakistan is concerned as far as bangladesh is concerned bangladesh has done well for itself it has come out as a more or less a stable economy very far cry from the basket case which henry kissinger had described it in the early day early years of 1975 76 it has stabilized its economy it has stabilized its government it has stabilized so many other things but if bangladesh continues to persecute the biharis or the people who stood for a united pakistan and instead punish them in kangaroo courts it, if it is willing to do that because after all there was a tripartite agreement between india pakistan and bangladesh which was signed by sheikh mujibur rahman himself that there will be no persecution there will be no war trials so i think in the interest of both bangladesh and pakistan if the wall of berlin can fall if european union can come together after 100 years of wars we cannot rejoin again as a nation but bangladesh as a sovereign nation pakistan as a sovereign nation perhaps under the umbrella of sark and please remember that sark was the brainchild of general ziaur rahman one of the presidents of bangladesh let us have a confederation where we can pool our resources where we can live in harmony and benefit from each other's strengths rather than continue to harp upon and break the old wounds let us go towards healing that's the need of the art